Hello, I'm Andrew Bailey and welcome to the second episode of Masters of TESOL. I'll be speaking to the people attached to the biggest brains in the industry. We'll hit on the practical, theoretical, the mind expanding and the nuts and bolts of teaching English to speakers of other languages. Today, gestures, and more specifically the question... Does the body rule the mind or does the mind rule the body? Although he admitted... I don't know. Now, Morrissey poses a very interesting research question here. How far do gestures enhance cognition? As teachers, we instinctively point behind us to indicate the past and point forward to indicate the future. And except for tribes like the Yupno tribe in Papua New Guinea, who reverse that with the future behind you as an unknowable, unseeable thing, those gestures are kind of universal. When we're teaching, we might make circular motions with our hands to indicate a progressive tense. And anyone who's taught kids will have used total physical response. Stand up, sit down, go to the back of the room. But research shows that gestures can be used for a lot more metaphoric language and go beyond simple physical movements. In fact, studies show that cognitive embodiment can deepen the understanding of a language and improve recall. Someone who knows a little bit more than Morrissey is Scott Thornbury. He's been an educator for over 30 years and has written loads of books on language and methodology. I was lucky enough to catch or ambush him outside the co conference in Seoul, put my phone in his face, and he was kind enough to give us an interview for this show. So, gestures. It can't be that complicated, can it? Your workshop today was about the mind and the body and education. So could you give us a bit of background on that? Yeah, well, I mean, traditionally, um, and I've always thought of cognition as being a purely mental process and that everything that we know and that we learn, and uh, including language, is sort of centred in that kind of grey stuff in, 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 in the skull. Um, <laughs> but I'm... Uh, although I've always had the suspicion that there's more to language learning, at least, than the intellectual side of it and that uh, I mean, we've known for some time thanks to the humanists that uh, the emotions of course are engaged and, and have a pay, play a huge part and not least in motivation and attitudes. Uh, now discovering or what's being discovered by cognitive scientists and cognitive linguists is that um, the uh, mind is only part of it and the mind is actually interdependent of, of the body itself and our own sense of our physicality and this in a sense, the people have been looking at language in terms of our experience of the world as, as, as we experience as, as, as physical human beings and through our body and by means of our body plays a large part in how we construct our, our knowledge and this extends then to the, the notion of language and language learning itself and first language learning and second language learning that it's now this whole notion of embodied cognition is becoming very much the flavour of the month and hopefully (laughs) of the decade. And it has implications, as I was pointing out in my workshop this morning, in terms of how we teach languages. And we've always known, teachers of children have always known that it gets children moving and uh, using action songs and games etc has played an important role in both first language and second language learning we've known that we've never quite known why I think it's been sort of seen well, it's, it's motivational etc but now studies are showing that in fact children learn better when they associate particular movements and gestures with not just words and language but also with mathematical concepts so what we're discovering what is being discovered about children learning concepts in their first language, not just language, but mathematical concepts too, that this is aided and memory and recall are are bettered when the learning is associated with particular gestures and movements. And this um, also has been shown in studies of second language learning through uh, of vocabulary principally that uh, recall is much better when it's associated with movement. Um, is that the, the teacher's movement? Or? No, not necessarily, although that's obviously very important, but when students uh, enact uh, the meanings of words that they're learning, and not just literal words like different kinds of walking and that, but perhaps the particles of phrasal verbs, for example, to look up, to write down, and that kind of thing, that um, they not only learn them better, but they're able to kind of extend the meanings, the literal meanings, into more metaphorical meanings. But yes, it's true, they don't actually themselves have to do it, but if they see somebody doing it, it seems to be equally powerful. 
Uh, An example of this would be the difference between a cup of coffee and a cup for coffee. Now, with this physical association, kind of tapping your fists together might show a cup of coffee, whereas a cup for coffee might be kind of putting your open palms forward, like it's a cup for coffee. So what I've been looking at is ways that this might be extended, not just not just vocabulary, but the learning of the grammatical system as well. And I've discovered that I'm not alone in this. <laughs> that a number of people uh, are working in this uh, direction. In fact, there's a French scholar who's put together a whole collection of, well, it's a, it's a, a course, basically, where he recruited a number of actors and professional mimes to... Um, embody different language uh, grammatical structures in English so because we're familiar when we teach the past simple we tend to all teachers make a gesture behind them uh, but with he's taken this to another degree altogether and it's really interesting quite powerful and I think for example have you ever they would reach behind them as if feeling for something in the past and for a positive answer they would bring out their hands as if they were holding something and for a negative answer, they would bring out their hands and present it as an empty palm. Well, I haven't had experience trying them out in the classroom myself, but in workshops that I've done with teachers, I've found a very positive response to this, this idea that the um, grammatical system can, in a sense, be captured through, through gesture okay. and mime. And, and this is not just, we're not talking about kinesthetic learners or you know some kind of intelligence here we're talking about something that seems to be a common human uh, propensity to learn through movement and it seems that movement uh, helps us not only remember things but it in a sense kind of offloads some of the cognitive work that's being done in the mind onto the body itself and we do this on a daily basis when we kind of count on our fingers how many you know things we need to buy at the supermarket uh, we're constantly using our body as a kind of a, a way of retrieving or re storing knowledge mm -hmm. and I think that this has interesting implications in terms of language learning and uh, there's a lot of interesting stuff coming out now showing how just not only the way that teachers can help construct learning experiences for, for their students through creating a kind of uh, physical space but how learners when they interact with this themselves and I actually co-wrote an article that came out last year where uh, my co-writer had collected some really interesting classroom data. She had videoed students doing pair work tasks and she found nice, nice little moments where they are actually helping each other understand mm. these concepts through um, use of gesture which they then sort of pick up from each other and kind of uh, replicate not just the language <laughs> but the gestures. Okay. So this is suggesting that now when we look at classroom interaction we need to look at not just the words that students are saying to each other, right. which has always been the focus of classroom-based research, but we need to look at how they're actually interacting physically right. through their eye gaze, through their gesture, and even the way that they align themselves, their whole body mm. uh, position in relation to each other. Amazing, right. It is very interesting. There's a researcher in Japan, in fact, I was at a JALT conference a couple of years ago who's at the forefront of this field, Takako Nishina, I think her name is, and she... She did a fabulous presentation showing, again, how two students working on a kind of translation task to each other, with each other, kind of um, aligned themselves and disaligned themselves according to when they were in agreement and when they were not in agreement. Right. And yeah. it's kind of stuff that we kind of always known intuitively right. that, that students work, when they work together, you can tell, looking at them, to what extent they're in harmony or not, uh -huh. simply through their, kind of like their rapport, gestures. Physical well, rapport. it is physical rapport, yes. It's there, and there seems to be a lot more to it now than simply the kind of um, affective side of things, the emotional side of things. It seems to be there's, there's cognitive work going on there, which, again, supports the idea that cognition is happening not just in the brain, but it's happening in our whole total physicality, if you were. If somebody wanted to find out more about this, are there any resources you'd recommend? Yes, uh, there's quite a lot of literature now in the field of psychology uh, on what on this general subject called embodied cognition or sometimes situated cognition, which is kind of slightly broader field. Mm. Although not a lot of it's been made that sort of user friendly in terms of lay people. <laughs> okay. But um, I'm reading a book at the moment which is called uh, Louder Than Words uh, by a guy called Bergen. And that brings it, makes it much, it makes it very accessible. Uh, that's been out for a couple of years. 
And if you follow the applied linguistics journals like Modern Language Journal or Applied Linguistics itself, you'll find there's more and more articles coming out about gesture now and paralinguistics generally. So this, it does seem to be a kind of growing field. And in fact, a researcher who's preeminent in this field, a woman called Marion Gulberg, who I referenced in my talk this morning, she, she was saying to me that it's a field that really is wide open and anybody looking to do a PhD, for example, you know, the sky's the limit. It's not a well-tilled field, as it were. It's, 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 it's in second language acquisition specifically. So, um, you know, it's that's one a, to watch. That's a top tip for Absolutely, everybody. absolutely. <laughs> All right, absolutely fascinating. So thank you very much. It's a pleasure, time. Andrew. It's a pleasure. So there we have it. Gestures, much more than just standing up and sitting down. If you've enjoyed the show, then please subscribe on iTunes or your